Remember, don't get stuck with another sticker company. Stick with StickerYeti.com for all of your sticker needs and much, much more. Sticker Yeti is the place for all of your needs when it comes to stickers. Check them out today. Now you do have it. It's working this time, right? The audio is, is good. No, see, I just started recording, and look, everybody, it's comedian Ryan Niemiller, <laughs> uh, a former Indiana State University Sycamore, a Hoosier. He's funny, and he's a comedian. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, this is uh, uh, not, not to get to uh, how the sausage is made, but this is round two for us attempting this. So. Yes, it is. And I will say, though, I did very good the first time around because I was the only one that could be heard. Yeah, <laughs> you were like, I'm bringing most of the interesting for this one, so I'm going to go ahead and cut him out, and then we'll just fill in the blanks later. Yeah, I po I posted it, and probably about uh, maybe a minute in, people were sending me messages, look, I can't hear him, I can't hear him. <laughs> and most people were like, I hear you fine, I hear you fine, but I need to hear him. <laughs> hey, Ryan, if uh, we all know that you love wrestling and you want to be a professional wrestler. What would yes. be your... what? Do you have like five songs you would have used for your intro music into the ring? Oh, I, I never got that far in. Um, but for, for me, like, I, mean, I do this with anything artistic now. I'm fortunate enough to know enough cool people that do a lot of different things that I probably would have had a couple of my friends, like, make something for me and, and try to do that. Like, I mean, that, that's it's so hard to get any kind of break in any kind of these businesses. Um, I, I never thought of, I, I'm so bad, the type of music I like is not conducive to pro wrestling. Like, like I, I'm bummed out that Corona has uh, canceled a Matchbox 20 concert, if that tells you where I'm at <laughs> as a music fan. So I don't know if that's exactly uh, the intimidating song <laughs> that people are looking for. And, uh, uh, and, and we're using Skype. Do, does anybody really use Skype uh, anymore? Are the millennials doing Zoom? Are the old folks doing Zoom? Why, why are we, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I'll be honest. Uh, other than this interview, I've mostly ever used Skype to do like fantasy football drafts. <laughs> and things like that. It, it, it's something that people who aren't tech savvy, like myself, <laughs> usually use because every computer has Skype on it. <laughs> so you can kind of start from there. Now, I just want to let everybody know that uh, I'm a little bit in the dark because our AC went out two weeks ago. We had to wait two weeks before the American Home Shield warranty kicked in. And uh, they're going to put a new one on the roof tomorrow. So if you see beads of sweat rolling down me, hey, just enjoy it and make fun of me. Yeah, I assume you were just really nervous to talk to me a second time. And it's getting you, getting you a little whoo. You know what? It, it, it is. But you know what? I'm coming off of an interview with Wang Chung. So, you know, I was prepared for you. Okay, okay. I I'm often called the Wang Chung of comedy, so that's uh, <laughs> you just have a nice little thread going here. You got a you got a gimmick now for this show. <laughs> um, so, tell us a little bit about what the coronavirus has done to comedy. Oh, it is. Um, and I, I want to go ahead and start what I'm about to say with the no. I want everyone to understand that I know. There are way more serious implications out there about this disease than I don't get to work for a while. I, I, I understand a lot of this is going to be first world problems kind of thing. But right now, it, it's so tricky. Um, I haven't done any shows in front of a crowd since March. So, so obviously, it, it's affecting that on a literal just we can't gather to watch comedy shows right now. Um, where, where it also gets tricky is that every state does things so differently that it's hard telling when everything's going to open up. Because because there's some states that are already running comedy shows. So some get to do it at 25 you know percent capacity, some 50. There's a couple places, I guess, that are running at full capacity. That's the that's a rarity. Um, some states get to open because comedy clubs have been determined are like restaurants. Some states can't open because they've determined comedy clubs run like bars. So so right now it's this whole, some have got lucky. I've had friends that have already done three or four weekends. Um, I've had four weekends where I was supposed to be the first person back get canceled because the state or the city decided, hey, we're not ready. Let's push it back, um, which was the right call. Like, obviously, I want to be safe. I want everyone else to be safe. But it, you also have to work. And that's, I think, the frustrating part of this is 
whether I agree if we should be opening or not is irrelevant because no one's going to pay my bills. And that's the unfortunate state of it. That's why I'm getting so frustrated anytime anyone's like, well, if you're scared, just stay home and let us go out. Okay. Are you going to pay my bills? Are you going to, you know, are you going to let me No, we're not, we're not giving you a free ride. Well then shut up. I don't have the option to stay home. Do I? <laughs> so it's, it's one of those kind of damned if you do damned if you don't, you know, cause comfortability wise, I'd probably rather stay home for another month or so just so everything can get back under control, you don't have those options. Uh, the other weird thing that's done to comedy, and this is something I'm glad is happening, it's also giving a lot of uh, a lot of people's problematic pasts are coming up. And, and, and there's certain things, uh, I don't agree in cancel culture when it comes to like a joke that someone told 15 years ago, that probably doesn't deserve to have someone be canceled. However, if you're sending a lot of inappropriate messages to uh, to people and sexually harassing people, yeah, let's bring that to light. So, so it's also given a lot of people time to to see things like that and figure it out. It's a very weird time for entertainment as a whole, not just comedy, because none of it can happen, and online is just not the same for shows. You know, it's interesting you say that because uh, last night uh, it, it was very uncomfortable watching AGT. Did you uh, uh, tune in last night? Uh, I watched a few of the individual clips because uh, there was a couple comics on and I watched that. Um, it's definitely a sign of our uh, of just what's going on, you know, because those were taped in in March. So you actually got to see the progression of everything started out normal and there's these packed houses and then Heidi got sick. And so she was just gone because at that time... Didn't know. I don't think she had corona. I think she just got sick. But at the time, everyone was freaking out. You don't know what it is. So then she's temporarily replaced. And then they go from having an audience with no Heidi to now there's no audience. And I, I mean, kudos to anyone who had to do their audition that way. Having done the experience the year before, especially as a comedian, I can't imagine how difficult that has to be for like, that like gets nerve wracking anyway, because it's the biggest opportunity of your career. And then factor that, oh, you don't have the audience on your side to like build that energy up. So, uh, so, so kudos to anyone who did that. Cause that was, uh, it's, it's weird. It's definitely a little uncomfortable and a little eerie. I was watching a comedian last night on the show and it, it just looks so difficult to perform for three people. Oh, it, Yeah. Well, welcome to the first ten years of my career. <laughs> Doing that, it's, uh, see, I would have been. It would have been great for me. I would have been just right. That's my wheelhouse right there. Yeah, but uh, but I, I thought like because there were the two comics on last night. Michael Yo, I think killed it. Um, I think he. I mean, he's a seasoned pro and he's a great dude. Um, and and then uh, Crystal, um, who who is from Texas, like, like for hers, like like she still was very funny and did well. But you could tell with hers just how that energy was because she does a lot of act out. She does. She was doing stuff like, like it's hard to be that energetic and do those things yeah. for four people. You know, if you have four thousand in there, you can play with that energy. You can do stuff. So, so kudos to both of them for powering through. But yeah, it, it definitely definitely is weird. Um, tell everybody a little bit about where you're from in Indiana. Give them kind of an idea of uh, where you were born and raised. Sure. So. Um, Technically, I was born down in Bedford, Indiana, so kind of in that area, but I wasn't there long enough to ever claim it. <laughs> um, I think we moved when I was like one, if that. My dad got some jobs up at the steel mills in Chicago, up in that area. Uh, so I grew up in DeMott, Indiana, a little uh, little small town in the region. Uh, it's about as big as it sounds for anyone who hasn't been there before. Um, very tiny town. Uh, give you some perspective. We um, threw a town celebration when we got our first stoplight. If that gives you <laughs> an idea of who we are, but yeah, yeah, I'm an old trailer park kid. So I grew up in a trailer. Uh, six of us packed in a single wide, and uh, uh, yeah, it, it was very, especially with what I've done now, it was a very interesting upbringing to come from that to what I'm doing at this moment. You, you know, I've, I've heard the phrase. My mom used to tell me this when I was a kid. Is and and and. I like both. I like both of them. I didn't understand, but she would tell me when I'd get notes from the teachers. They're not laughing with you. They're not laughing at. They're not laughing with you. They're laughing at you. What? I right. Mean, I mean, to a comedian or someone who's trying to be funny, aren't both of those the same? 
they, they, they both are very effective depending on what you're going for. <laughs> that's all it is. If you're getting laughs and that's all you care about, then yeah. Um, it, it never bothered me. I mean, I have a, a pretty obvious disability. So for me, I was my, my skill set involves being able to turn people who might have laughed at me to laugh with me. I was so much better at making the jokes that no one ever, I never got really bullied. Um, I, cause, cause like no one could keep up with what I was doing <laughs> to myself, let alone anyone else. So, so yeah, but, but for me, like whatever, a laugh's a laugh, you know? And even if you kind of embarrass yourself a little bit sometimes, whatever, you know, it's, it's how you kind of then work with that and change it. So I, I think a, a healthy combination of both can be very effective. What were some of your favorite wrestlers growing up? Uh, favorite wrestlers? Um, I was always um, a fan of kind of the underdogs and the less appreciated guys. Um, I, I've, I've always been slightly contrarian that way, and I don't know, just with everything. I was probably the only kid who grew up near Chicago in the 90s who didn't like the Chicago Bulls. Like, to give you an idea. Because for me, like, clearly they're probably the greatest team of all time, but, like, it wasn't fun in my eyes to be a Bulls fan because, like, you pretty much knew they were going to win. So where's, like, the excitement? I get if you're, like, a long time and had seen them fail for two decades, then you're excited to finally see it. But, like, who, who jumps in and is a Yankees fan right away, you know? Who, like, I, I never found the fun of that. And, and even with wrestling, like, like even some of the top guys, like, like I never really got into Hulk Hogan that much I, I was always a fan of guys like coco beware and then like getting into like the 90s like tatanka it, it just, just like kind of like some of the more offshoot guys um uh, and, and even that's how i grew to be such a huge fan of chris jericho because he started as one of those guys he wasn't who he is now at that time he was kind of like a lesser known scrappy up-and-coming guy who was kind of being overlooked and held down and i've always appreciated those stories a lot more you know, it's why, inter- why I'm a Cubs fan. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you you weren't a Bulls fan, but but wait, but wait, wait, but wait. So I like to play a game with some people. We can go back and forth, back and forth, naming sure. wrestlers or or uh, players on a baseball team. You know, uh, you know, when someone came to me the other day and said, "How many wrestlers can you name?" I mean, I started going, you know, Brutus the Barber Beefcake, uh, Ricky the Steamboat Dragon, Jake the Snake Roberts, and people were going. Those are wrestlers? I'm like, oh, oh yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the Honky Tonk Man. Are you oh, kidding yeah. me? Yeah, yeah. I, I could do thousands. Like, uh, to give you an idea of what my wrestling fandom has looked like, um, to this day, um, for lack of a better phrase, I still write my own pro wrestling fan fiction. And that is 100% true. There's a, a, an old game... Uh, it was a wrestling simulator, and it was text-based. It was called TNM. It was made by a really good friend of mine. Um, he actually just released some new stuff for it. It's a little cheap plug, tnmte.com, if you're a wrestling nerd like me. Um, but basically, it lets you make your own wrestling promotion and like run your own matches and run everything. And I always loved like the creative side of something. It's clearly niche, and it's clearly super nerdy. But like for me, it was my version of of being the weird kid who liked D&D, you know, who wanted to live in this kind of other fantasy world. For me, instead of it being, you know, that kind of fantasy, it was, oh, I'm Vince McMahon, and I'm going to <laughs> run this and, and come up with these stories and do that. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think... I, I don't trust anyone who doesn't have something like that that they enjoy for no other reason than it just makes you happy. Well, like for me, that does not, that's never going to pay the bills. That's not helping me buy a house. That's not getting me bigger in comedy. Like I'm, I'm not going to get discovered and win an Oscar <laughs> because someone read my nerdy wrestling stuff, but it just makes me happy. And I think everyone should have something like that. So up and around the Chicago area, were you a Bears fan or I think you're a Dolphins fan now? How did that transpire? Oh, gosh. I, I have so many. My, my sports fandom's weird. So the only team that I actually picked up from growing up that way was the Cubs. So so I'm still a Chicago Cubs fan. And, and, and the big selling point for them, like now obviously in 2016, this changed finally. 
but they but they're perennial losers. They they were the perennial underdogs. They're the team that like you want to see get over the hump, but they just never could. Whether it was bad luck or stumbling over their own damn feet or <laughs> whatever it is. Um, so so I was, I'm a Cubs fan for that reason. I'm a Dolphins fan because as a rebellious eight year old, <laughs> um, uh, my dad was a huge Bears fan. And when I was eight, I was like, you know, I'm not going to like what my dad likes. I'm going to like my own thing. Um, so I'm like, I'm going to pick the team that's furthest away. And uh, I didn't know a whole lot about geography at eight years old, or I should be a Seahawks fan or a 49ers fan. But uh, I picked the Dolphins. Uh, I, I like the colors. And again, another nerdy thing, um, one of my favorite video games of all time is Tecmo Super Bowl. For the original Nintendo, and Dan Marino was so good on that game. I loved playing as the Dolphins, and it just kind of stuck. Uh, I'm also a Clippers fan uh, for basketball, and um, I picked, the, just so everyone knows, I picked the Clippers before they were good. <laughs> um, I, I became a Clippers fan out of pure spite. There was no other reason but spite. <laughs> uh, when I first lived out in Los Angeles, I just moved back out here now, uh, but I lived there... 2006 to 2009 kind of in that area and that was the last time where the lakers were really good you know where they were the lakers and the lakers ruined so many comedy shows for me um you know because either the lakers would lose and everyone in the bar would be just so angry and didn't want to listen to any of our nonsense or the Lakers would win, and everyone just wanted to drink and party and didn't want to listen to our nonsense. So out of pure spite, I was like, you know what? I'm a Clippers fan. I don't care if they suck. Screw the Lakers. I'm a Clippers fan. And then they got pretty good, so it kind of worked out for me. But It, it kind of reminds me of uh, the, the, the dumbest jokes that I put in my head and remember. It's like, you know, uh, the, it was a mom joke. Someone told your mom the Clippers were in town, so she thought she was going to get a haircut. <laughs> so so being which, a which, being, you see i need i want the clippers to be back in town i need one i'm on that qu quarantine haircut and i don't trust my girlfriend to cut my hair so <laughs> hey what's it like though like i was a buccaneers fan before they got good what's it oh. like though isn't it kind of, isn't it kind of aggravating though to be a cubs fan and they win the world series and now you got you have all these new cubs fans uh, for yes and no, um, at, at least with the Cubs, I, I feel the one thing the Cubs have for them, for better or worse, is a pretty loyal fan base. Um, you know, pe people have, people definitely waited through it <laughs> to get to it. Um, for me, as far as bandwagon goes, it doesn't bother me that much, only because it's not my place to police how into something somebody is. Like, for me, if I'm going to be a fan of something, I go all out. I, I'm a nerd. I look at box scores. I'm looking at, you know, all that stuff. That's just what I enjoy personally. Not everyone likes sports on that way. Some, some people just like to be in a fun party atmosphere, and that party atmosphere happens when people are winning. So, it, it can it be a little annoying? Sure. But it also doesn't affect my fandom, it doesn't take away from what I feel about the team. So, whatever. People, sports is just about people having an excuse to drink. That's like 75% of it. So, <laughs> whatever. Have fun. Do it. I'm still going to watch the games the way I watch them. So, what kind of a football player was Ryan? Um, I was an average one <laughs> at best. So, uh, so I went to Kinky Valley High School, um, Northwest Indiana, uh, I was an uh, offensive lineman. I was one of the bigger kids on our team. We were pretty small. Like, I, I was only 220 pounds, and I was one of the biggest kids. We're not exactly a football powerhouse uh, by any means on high school. But uh, for me, it was it was fun. I, like, I enjoyed it. I, I worked hard once I kind of got it in my head that this was something I really wanted to put some time into. I, I knew I, I didn't have... I'm not athletic enough where I was ever going to play in college or anything like that. It just wasn't who I was. But uh, I, I tried to have fun. Um, some people took it really seriously. And my kind of job on the team was to bring some levity to it. So so I would always do things like um, – because obviously I was never going to like overpower anybody on the offensive line. <laughs> uh, so, so what I would do every single game – 
the very first play I was out there, I would walk up to the line and stick my hand out to the defensive guy in front of me and be like, hey, good luck out there today. <laughs> it would weird him out so much that he would never hit me. Like, like there was only one guy I remember who actually still like kind of brought it the normal way and that day sucked. <laughs> but everybody else would take it easier on me because they didn't want to hurt the guy with a disability. It's all, you got, you got to work uh, smarter, not harder, Billy. <laughs> all right. And that, that was... Uh, the entirety of my uh, football career. It was, it was a lot of fun. Who were some of your favorite comedians growing up? Uh, favorite comedians growing up? Um, so my, uh, I have some uh, fondness for some people that are a little ridiculous, uh, but it was kind of because um, my dad and I really didn't bond on a whole lot of things. My dad had some issues with alcohol and things like that. So he wasn't always the most pleasant human being to be around. Um, but one of the really positive memories I always had was he would sometimes let me stay up late with him to watch some comedian on television because he really enjoyed stand-up comedy. So a lot of my more positive memories with him are sitting on the couch and watching some stuff that, I mean, I was probably too young to understand a lot of it, but just seeing how happy it made my dad kind of planted a little bit of that seed that like, oh, I might, like, this seems to be something that like makes people happy. Like you can kind of take even people who are sometimes at their worst, like my dad was, it would make him a normal kind of pleasant human. Um, so we used to sit up and watch um, a lot of Gallagher. My dad loved Gallagher, who, you know, ridiculous now, but, but, you know, so, so I do have some affinity for some watermelon smashing. Um, I still go... Uh, a lot of people probably from that time can still go to a grocery store and every time you see watermelons, you picture smashing it with a sledgehammer. Like that's <laughs> just how it is. Um, uh, Dana Carvey, my dad loved Dana Carvey. There was that uh, special that aired on Comedy Central about a billion times in the early 90s before Comedy Central had a lot of uh, stuff in the can <laughs> at that point. Um, those are probably the two major ones I remember. Uh, I remember when I discovered Brian Regan, it was a big deal for me. Um, Dave Chappelle, when I started getting like high school on that time was when he was starting to really blow up. Um, Gaffigan, I'm a big fan of Jim Gaffigan to this day. A uh, Hoosier. He, uh, exactly, yeah, he's from he's from the region as well. I think he grew up in the Chesterton area. And, and legitimately, um, Gaffigan was one of those people that kind of convinced me in the back of my head, like, oh, he's from the same area I am. If he can make it in comedy from here, why can't I? Like, you know, because, you know, Indiana isn't exactly the mecca of entertainment. You don't think of it that way. It's not It's not where you think stars are going to be, you know, grown and blossom. But seeing somebody from the same area as you make it big in something like that kind of gets you in your head like, oh, well, hell, I can do that too, right? So, so you know, your dad, you said, had some problems with uh, alcohol. How do you stay away from that or use that to your advantage as your career grows? Uh, for me, uh, I find with a, uh, a lot of people who might have grown up in a, in a household that had issues with alcohol, you kind of go one or two ways. You either uh, follow in their footsteps or you sort of overcorrect and go the other way. Um, I am definitely an overcorrect. So uh, I, to this day, I, I'm 38 years old now. I've never, I don't know what the feeling of being drunk is. I've never experienced wow. that. I, I've sipped things here and there just to taste it or, you know, when someone's like, hey, check out this drink. And this, I'm like, okay, yeah, fine. I don't know what feeling buzzed is like. Because um, for me, like, it runs in my family. My My dad obviously had it. My grandpa had it. Um, it was just one of those things that like, I know what my personality is and what my body will do. And I know if I started, I wouldn't stop. That can be tricky in comedy because, um, a, a huge part of the sort of bonding, like, like for com comedy, it's very important. The hang is very important. It's just going to the, even if you're not performing, it's going to the comedy clubs. It's, it's being present, being around, hanging out. And a lot of that involves, because it's adults, and I don't judge anyone for it, because whatever, but 
it, it involves being at the bars and staying at the comedy clubs and drinking and hanging out. Um, that That's just not fun for me. I don't judge anyone that does it. But if you don't drink, you don't want to be around a lot of people who are drunk for several hours at a time. It's just not fun after a while. Um, I got the reputation, and it was not necessarily negative, but um, one of the comedy club owners in Indianapolis used to call me the most boring comedian in Indianapolis. Because he was like, you know, you're, you're a great guy, you hang out, you're very nice to everyone, you have a good time, but the second the shows are over, you're out of there. And I'm like, well, yeah, because it's not fun for me. So um, it, it, it's it's been a little hard on that front sometimes because it does stunt you a little bit. If you're not hanging out, you don't get noticed as quickly because you're just not there. On, on the other front, though, um, I, I've not sabotaged myself in any way. Um, sometimes people get, get a little too far into that, and it can stunt their growth that way. Um, everything I've ever done on stage is with clear mind. So I know it, it helps me realize, okay, is this funny? Is this not funny? It's helped with my self-awareness a ton. And um, there's there's plenty of like-minded people with me. Uh, my, my road opener, uh, Dave Yates, he's one of my best friends in the world. I've known him for 10 years, a very funny comic. Um, he's sober. So he's been he's been sober for like nine years. So he for me, he's someone great to take on the road with me when we have a road that is, that's been, it's been a while, <laughs> but because for me, I know, Hey, I have a good friend that I trust and he's not going to want to do those type of things that I don't enjoy doing. So it, it's nice to have someone like that to kind of hang out with and you don't have to like babysit or watch or be worried about. So we just have, we just play a lot of video games and watch a lot of sports and, and all that type of stuff. So so it is possible to do this, but yeah, it, it can affect you for a while. And you spent four years in Terre Haute, so that's impressive. Oh, I spent more than four years in Terre Haute. That's, uh, uh, I spent a good chunk of my 20s off and on <laughs> in Terre Haute, both with graduating, and then for some reason, I came back. <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah, that's where I came. A- after uh, L.A. didn't work out for me the first time, I moved back to Terre Haute. Uh, I went back to school for a year thinking, like, I was in that, like, little stage, like, oh, it's never going to work. I have to get a real degree. My theater degree isn't going to ever. Like, half my student loan debt was that one year of college that I came back thinking that I had to get something practical. (laughs) And and if you want to smell railroad tie stuff, just spend a summer in Terre Haute. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the funny thing is, from what people told me, it used to be worse, like when I was in college, people were like, "Oh, this is nothing compared to what it used to be when the, uh, the what was it, the paper processing mill or whatever it was <laughs> it was going." I was like, "This isn't the bad smell." <laughs> so, what was the move like uh, last time I chatted with myself to you, but we couldn't hear you? <laughs> uh, what you were still in Indianapolis? What's the yes. move been like? Uh, do you enjoy California? Are you uh, getting acclimated? Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, well, right now, uh, because the world is shut down for the most part, uh, California is exactly the same as Indiana. <laughs> it's uh, uh, Basically, it's just sunnier out the window that I have to look at when I go there. Uh, it's, been, it's been a little weird. Like, uh, I, I moved here, uh, moved in with my girlfriend, so that, that's been very good. It's, it was, it's hard being 2,000 miles apart even without being in the middle of a pandemic or something like that. So, so, so that's been good. Um, decided we, we were going to do this move later in the year, probably the end of the year, but with everything kind of being shut down, I figured once things really get going, I'm not going to have this kind of time again. So I was like, screw it. Let's, it'll be scary, but let's just go ahead and I'll pack up a U-Haul now and we'll just go ahead and take care of this. Uh, for the most part, it's been fine. Like, obviously, I miss my family back home. But, um, you know, with my job, I can do it from anywhere. I just have to be relatively close to an airport, and I'm good. And uh, uh, I- I'm looking forward to reacclimating to California. When I first lived here, I was not uh, mature enough. I had literally gone from Terre Haute being the biggest place I'd ever lived <laughs> straight to like the middle of, of California. And I, I just wasn't ready. Emotionally, I wasn't ready. Financially, I wasn't ready. Like I just wasn't in the place for it. 
I'm a lot better now, so I'm looking forward to when those things exist again, really getting to enjoy what California has to offer. I, I, I love Indiana. I, I love the Midwest. Uh, in a perfect world, I would have stayed there forever. But in my business, you kind of have to sometimes be where the action is. And as much as I love Indiana, you're probably not going to get discovered by any, you know, studio heads from Sony or <laughs> anything like that there. It's just, it's just how it is. And so have you, so, got, have you gotten out and about to see, uh, like, the uh, Hollywood Walk of Fame? Or have you, have you, I guess you probably did that last time you were there, though. Before oh, I am out. so sick of the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Um, so, so all the live shows for AGT are done at the Dolby Theater, which is right in the middle of the Walk of Fame. So you go out of that, that theater, you're pretty much right there on it. So, so I'm so sick of seeing, of almost running into people who want to take pictures of like Michael Jackson's star. Like no one in that area has any spatial awareness whatsoever. They're just so excited to see names they recognize. Uh, I was almost accidentally intimate with a lot of people who just stop right in front of you suddenly, <laughs> and you're just like, "Whoa, okay, that's what's happening now." Yeah, if I ever never see uh, the Walk of Fame again, I will be a happy man. And if I'm not mistaken, don't you have to pay to get your your star on the Walk of Fame? Yep. And yep. then, so, and so, then there's so, a then there's a yearly fee to keep up maintenance. Yep. Yeah, you pay that, you do it yourself. I mean, I don't know what the... There's some kind of qualification. You have to have done something in... Like, like you couldn't be like somebody who, who starred in a couple of community theater productions in Terre Haute <laughs> and get something that there's some standard that they look at. But yeah, you basically, from what I understand, you pay for your own. And as long as you pay for the upkeep, you can... You can be a star. <laughs> you, you, you know, we we know all about it, but just, you know, give us kind of a little condensed version of what AGT meant meant to you. Oh, it, it 100% changed my life. It was, um, um, I, I, I can't imagine what it's like for people this season with everything being so weird. Um, I hope they get the same boost and the same experience that I did out of it. Um, because like it, it literally changed my life. Before I got AGT, I had been doing comedy for twelve years and making not a whole lot of traction. Like having a disability like I do, it was really hard to kind of get the ball rolling. Because because I was always good. If if people let me do shows, I was going to do a really really good job. I'm 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 a talented guy, but it was just so hard to get a lot of like bookers to take a chance on something like this because it's so different. It's uh, it's unique. Nobody looks like this. Nobody was doing this. Um, and and I, I'm glad I didn't quit. I, I almost quit comedy about a year before that. Um, I'd sort of made the decision. I was working a pretty decent job in Indianapolis. I had benefits, chances to move up. Like, like things were fine. And um, I kind of made a decision. I was like, either I'm just going to kind of stop. I'm going to make comedy a hobby and kind of focus on this. I was 36 at the time, you know? Like, you, you, it, it's cool being a starving artist for a while, but if you're in your 30s and you still have to have three roommates and you're still, you know, sleeping in your car to get to these gigs that make 200 bucks, like, your brain, it's hard for your brain not to go, did I screw up? Is it time to settle down and do something else? Um, but but I, I made the decision the other way. I was like, all right, I'm going to quit this job. I'm going to tackle comedy as hard as I can. At least give it that one final push. Because then if it doesn't work, at least I can say it wasn't because I was on the fence. Because I was, you know, floundering a little bit. And uh, luckily within about six months, um, AGT, uh, basically uh, I, I had a video that went viral um, that summer. And they saw it and loved it. And uh, I got to audition for the judges. And... Really, all you need uh, sometimes is just that one person to give you a chance. And for me, that one person is AGT. They, uh, um, as much as like, I think maybe eventually I could have gotten something like a Comedy Central spot or maybe, you know, Corden or something like that, which would be great. But AGT was perfect for me because not only do they let you show your talent and be good at what you do, you also get to tell your story. And for me, I thought that was very important to be able to really connect with people. 
Because if, if if all AGT wanted was somebody that can be funny for two minutes, there's thousands of comics that can do that. There's not thousands of comics that can kind of connect with people. And, and for me, just having that chance, it has completely changed my life. It's uh, uh, when that audition aired, like it's weird because I know the exact seven minutes that my life changed. It's a it's a very surreal feeling because not everybody gets to experience that. Tell us, last time that uh, I tried the interview, um, yeah. you told a great story about uh, uh, Simon Cowell and um, him kind of um, maybe uh, interchanging some words which he thought he hurt your feelings with. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, that, that, that it, it is one of my favorite stories. It's the one I like to tell about Simon because, you know, some of it might be justified, some of it's not. But, but Simon has this reputation for being a dick for lack of a better word. Like, you know, he has his reputation for being just mean for the sake of it. And and I never saw that. I, I never saw, um, from what I know of Simon, I think he's somebody that, that you know, he, he's not always right, but he, he says what he thinks is true, whether it's nice or not. Because, because I can tell you now, Simon doesn't know anything about stand-up comedy. He just doesn't. But, so if he gives an opinion, it might not be accurate because, you know, he doesn't know how the process works. But he's just going to tell it like it is. Um, but but I, I always got along uh, with, with Simon really well. We had the, the great moment, and this is how we really solidified what our relationship was. It was during the quarterfinals, um, and after I got voted through... Um, he kind of made a little uh, unintentional gaffe where he said, it's all in your hands now. Uh, uh, and, and I basically got to roast him a little bit on television. I go, oh, you, you want to try that again? It's in my one? No. Um, and he kind of got embarrassed and pushed through. But um, so for me, I wasn't offended. There wasn't anything that was mean-spirited about it. It was me kind of, the second he said it, I went, oh, 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 <laughs> this is great. I get <laughs> This is going to be a moment. I can do something. Because um, that was my strategy on AGT is like anytime I had that microphone in front of me, anytime I knew that camera was on me, I could do something to make it memorable. So that had nothing to do with my set. It was just like, oh, here's a moment I can capitalize on. Awesome. Um, but right after we went off the air, because I, I was near the end uh, of that episode, um, a a after every one of those uh, live shows, the judges will come on stage uh, after they go off the air and talk to the contestants a little bit, and then we all take a big group photo and, and things like that. But Simon came right up to me, uh, and he gave me a big hug, and he's like, I am so sorry. Uh, I, I hope you weren't offended. I hope you know what I meant. I hope you weren't offended by that. Uh, and I was like, offended? Are you kidding me? That was awesome. <laughs> I got to have this great moment on live television. Say more dumb shit next week. Let's just make this fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had a big laugh, so... So for me, I, I got along with him great. Um, I, I have um, the the whole AGT experience. You know, it's it's unique and it's different. But I have zero regrets about anything. I, I would do it all over again. I, I miss everyone there. Um, it goes by really fast, just like a lot of things in life that are really enjoyable. It's over kind of before you know it. But uh, I, I had a wonderful time, and I, I can't thank everyone from that show enough for what they did for me. You know, Ryan, uh, a lot of entertainers, performers, comedians, you know, uh, on social media, you know, won't respond or, you know, it, it, it's all about them. But what's really interesting with your social media is you, you'll respond and you'll interact with your fans. Uh, I, I do my best. Yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, as things grow, it, it's hard to get to everybody. It's just, you know, it, there's not enough time in the day. And that's just like the unfortunate truth about it. But um, for me, I, I appreciate everyone, like, legitimately, because, you know, I had 12 years of comedy where no one really cared, you know, like, where you're kind of beating your head against the wall, just hoping someone notices you. And, you know, the, the, the small fan base I had, they're very loyal, and they're still people I talk to today, because at that point, you can kind of become friends with everybody. There's not enough fans <laughs> to not do it, and it's this cool novelty, and... Um, for me, though, just kind of as things started blowing up, um, the way I've always looked at this type of thing, um, no one has to like you. No, no one, it, it just because I went on that TV show, it doesn't mean you have to be a fan. 
It doesn't mean you have to be, follow me on Instagram. It doesn't mean you have to buy a ticket or anything like that. So the fact that people want to and are excited to do so, the least I can do is say hi if someone says hi to me. Because cause, cause it's cool. Like, like, I don't look at myself this way because I'm just a kid who grew up in a trailer park in a small town in Indiana who worked hard and got lucky. Like, like that, that's basically who I am. And I, I know for some people, like, AGT is super important to them. It's like, it's their thing. And getting to meet or take a picture with somebody they saw on that show might be the coolest thing they've done in the last decade. Like, it's a big deal to them. And again, I don't see myself that way, but I, I know what it was like to get to meet people that I saw on television and appreciated what they did. Um, so for me, if, if the hardest thing I have to do is, is take a picture or respond to a DM and say, thank you, I will gladly do that. Cause again, no, no one has to care. No one has to like anything that I do and this could all go away at any time. So, you know, I, I definitely appreciate it. And, and, and I don't even understand like, as long as people are respectful, like, I don't want anyone interrupting. I, like, my girlfriend and I joke that, like, one day, because because I, I get stopped a lot. AGT is a very approachable show. People think they know you, so they approach you like they know you. Um, so my girlfriend and I joke that, like, one day I'm going to be trying to, like, propose to her, and somebody's going to be like, hey, I'm going to let you finish what you're doing. You mind if I get a selfie real fast? <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, ask my girlfriend to take the picture. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, it, for me, for me, it's great. It's, uh, it's been such a cool, humbling experience. And, um, uh, even selfishly, like, I don't understand why performers don't embrace that. Like, like, again, I understand if people are interrupting time with your kids or whatever like that, then yeah. But like, even selfishly, even if I didn't care about any of these people, taking that 20 seconds to just say hi and be a nice guy and take a picture means they're probably going to buy tickets to see you forever. They're going to buy merchandise. To, like, so th it's literally win-win. Even if you don't care, you're going to get their mo Like, I, I never understood it. Anytime anyone's ever been a dick to me, I'm like, well, fine. I just won't pay money for you anymore. Sorry. <laughs> so, Ryan, where can people follow you? And I love your logo behind you there. And I'm assuming right. that's uh, you can go to cripplethreat.com if I'm not mistaken, but yes, let right. everybody know where they can follow you and, uh, um, and you know, find out what Ryan's up to. Sure. So uh, right now I'm not up to a ton <laughs> like a lot of people, uh, but cripplethreat.com uh, is my website. It has my calendar up there for, but uh, in theory I'm booked out for the next several months, but we kind of know how that is right now. So take all that with a grain of salt. Um, obviously, I'm excited to get back to work, but I also want everyone to be safe and careful. That's my biggest priority. Um, so cripplethreat.com. Uh, all my social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, it's at cripplethreat8. So that's the number eight, uh, because there was seven before me, <laughs> clearly. Uh, awesome. But I've risen to power. So I am, uh, I'm now the toughest one. Uh, so you can find me on there. Uh, uh, like like you said, I'm, I'm very interactive. If you, if you leave a comment, you send a DM. Um, I try to get to as many as I can. Uh, I definitely appreciate everybody. So so come say hi. Uh, Club Nub's a pretty cool fan base. There, everyone is uh, generally pretty supportive. I try to push a lot of positivity. Um, don't want any uh, any negativity on there. It's just not. Uh, there's enough of that in my normal life. I don't want to deal with on there. So. So come have a good time. Um, working on some other projects that hopefully I can announce soon. Working on my own podcast. Working on some video stuff. Uh, hopefully we'll see that soon. Wanting to do it right. So yeah, come say hi. I'm like I said, very interactive. So let's uh, let's have some fun. Ryan, thank you so much for doing this. Not once, but twice. I appreciate it. Actually, if it doesn't work this time, you only get like three or four more chances, all right? So just know you're you're on a fine line right now. I appreciate it so much. Everyone will enjoy this. Take care. Thanks, buddy. Uh -huh. See you later.